Worthy is your name indeed, O Lord. We're so glad that you're here to worship the name of our God together. And this Advent season, if you're just joining us, whether online or in person, we're focusing on the great songs of our faith. In a moment, you're going to hear Pastor Joe speak to you about one of the great hymns of Advent. I'm excited for you to hear this and the theological truths that are contained in it. Another tradition we have at Advent is that we pick a partner through our Serve the World. If you don't know what Serve the World is, that's the way we talk about it. Make an impact locally and globally. Our ability to reproduce the gospel impact by being financially generous to local partners and global partners. And we select a project and a partner every Advent season as a whole church family to pray for and to give toward. We rolled that out and introduced you last week to our uh, project partner this year, Caring Network, by hearing a remarkable story. In case you missed that, we want you to hear that story again as we talk to you about this opportunity we have as a church family. Let's watch this together. As a family, we were always at church. Every Sunday, and youth groups, and Awana, but I don't think I had a relationship with God at that point in my life. In fact, I don't think I had a relationship with God until I, until the hardest point of my life. I mean, that's how God works, right? So then when I went to college, you know, not at home, not going to church, not walking with the Lord, not making good choices. When I found out that I was pregnant, I was depressed, basically, just so upset. Crisis is what I would consider that as. I thought, well, I'll just make this problem go away. We'll never speak of this. She said, I will give you that referral, but first I want you to do one thing for me. And I said, okay. She said, I want you to go to CareNet, is what it was called at the time. I, I want you to go there because I really feel it's important that you know what all your options are. I went there. I was able to speak with Lisa. She had a plan, and the plan was not to be a single mom, not to have an unplanned pregnancy. This doesn't fit in with where I saw my life going. So abortion was what was gonna solve that problem for her. She just gave me the freedom to just kind of talk it all out. I didn't feel any judgment whatsoever. Just the ability to freely talk about my concerns. The concerns about parenting were more like social concerns of like, my parents are gonna be disappointed, my church family is gonna be scandalized. I was hesitant to tell them because I wasn't married. I mean, what a disappointment that would be. But I just thought it would be so shameful. He did the ultrasound, and it was at that point that I realized that I saw my son's beating heart, and I realized he's, he's a real person. And so it was at that point that I realized I was going to be a mom. So in the ultrasound room, she seemed kind of softened, like she was receiving this gift that God had given to her that previously she was going to refuse. I remember the doctor saying something to the effect of, these are your parents. They're going to love you forever. Just tell them. And now that I'm a parent, that is true. He's 13 and a half now. He is in track and cross country. He wants to be an engineer. He's a good kid. My life is so much richer with my son in it. When he leaves in the morning, he writes me little notes. I think that's, that stuff is priceless. So when I first found out I was pregnant, it was just a problem that I needed to address. I needed to fix it. And then making the choice to parent. The, the stark contrast between then and now 
then I was single, now I'm married with more kids, now I have a great family, now I have a husband who's adopted my son, all because of making that one hard decision 14 years ago. I can't picture my life without him. Like, I don't even remember who I was 14 years ago. God is so gracious and good to me. I have a lot to be thankful for. God is so good and gracious to me, she said. He is to us all, and we have a lot to be thankful for. It's no secret, if you're paying attention, that our country right now is in the midst of a debate about the right to life, uh, and our Supreme Court is debating these things. But as followers of Jesus, this is not a political issue. I want to be, want to be clear about that. We, we serve and worship a God who says that every life in the moment of conception, from womb to tomb, is made in his image, created in the image of God, and therefore has inestimable value, and we should care for, pray for, and protect every life as much as we can. And so this ministry, Carry Network, comes alongside women facing this unthinkable decision and helps them, not just before, but during and after this decision, to choose life. What better thing for us to support at a time we celebrate God coming into the world as a baby? coming to give us life that we don't deserve and couldn't earn. So we encourage you to pray for Carry Network and their ministry. If God moves in your heart, to give to them. The way you can do that simply is put Serve the World or Carry Network in the memo of your check. You can choose it if you give online. There's an option for that. All the money we raise during this whole Advent season goes to support them. They have a goal. We have a goal of raise $250,000 to help them build two more facilities in our region to care for these women and expand their ministry. So join me in praying for them now and for God to do his work in our culture and in our own hearts. God, we worship you and thank you that you are the author of life. You've given us the gift of life, not just physical life, but spiritual life through your son, Jesus. And you place us in the world where we can help people choose life, physically and spiritually. Help us to be people that celebrate every life as made in your image. Thank you for ministries like Carry Network, who care for these women, come alongside them, not shame them, but help them choose life. Thank you, God, that you love us, you see us in every, whatever we are, and you care for us. Now we offer you our worship and our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's so good to be with you today. Thank you for joining us, and I'm so excited to spend some time in God's Word together. Whether you're here in person or joining us online, it is good to be together in this Advent season. Uh, before we dive into God's Word together, just a, a quick reminder, you should have received uh, the communion elements as you walked in today. If you haven't, just put your hand up right now, and our ushers will get that to you um, as we will be celebrating communion at the close of today's service. Well, today, what I want to do to start our time together is just to take a quick poll, just to kind of see where we're at um, as a church family. And so I'm curious for you when you think the Christmas season officially begins. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're just going to do this by a show of hands, and we're going to use Thanksgiving as, as our cutoff day. And I know we live in a polarizing culture, but this is a place of unity where you will experience love, even if you're wrong. So just by a show of hands, and this is going to be confusing for our ushers who are passing around communion, but, but by a show of hands, how many of you think that, uh, you know, the Christmas time begins, it's time to put up those decorations, it's time to listen to that Christmas music or start baking those Christmas cookies before Thanksgiving Day? Just by a show of hands, put them up. Wow, okay. And then how many of you who are uh, wise and patient souls led by the Lord would say after Thanksgiving is the time to begin. Wow, wow. The vast majority. 
Um, I shared this, uh, asked this question at our Saturday night service last night, and my wife was sitting all the way in the back, and she's someone who would put up stuff in like August if I let her, and, and it was her and one other hand, and all the way in the back I heard her just say, oh, whatever. <laughs> it was very funny. But I, I, I get it. I get it for her and for those of you that, that feel this way. For so many of us, there's this feeling of, of anticipation. So many things that we look forward to during this season that we have expectation or longing or hope about. And for a lot of us, we just can't wait to get it started. What about for you? Is there something that you are hoping for, longing for this Christmas? Is there something at the top of your list that you would like to receive this year? Many of you are aware, and many of you have been praying for and reaching out to us, uh, and are aware that eight weeks ago today, uh, Judy gave birth to our first son, Luca David Scavato. In fact, I brought a picture with me. Thank you very much. Look how cute he is. I could have brought like 100 pictures, but that's probably not the baby you came here to hear about. Many of you are aware of this. Uh, Luca came uh, actually 10 weeks early, and so he's been in the NICU uh, these first eight weeks of his life. And so I can tell you that there's one thing this Christmas that I am longing for more than anything else, that we are longing for, hoping for him to come home, for our family to be together. And I, I don't think I've ever hoped for or longed for sleepless nights changing diapers for Christmas, but right now it sounds pretty great. What about you? What are you hoping for? longing for, expecting this year? Is there something at the top of your list? I I think it's true that for many of us, the things that we long for or the things that we wait for, the things that we daydream about reveal what's most important to us. It shows us what truly matters in our hearts. And this idea, this idea of longing and expectation is what we're going to be talking about today as we continue in this series, Carols of the King. If you were here last week, maybe you remember Pastor Jeff beginning our time as we looked at this song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We talked about this idea of what Advent means, this idea of an arrival, and this idea that when we sing out Emmanuel, God with us, that is the truth that we can hold on to today. So that brings us to the song we just sang, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, the song that we'll be exploring in our time today, not just for the beauty of the melody, but for the truth that we see in it, the truth in God's word that lies behind it, that as followers of Jesus, we live in a state of waiting and longing and expectation, 365 days a year, not just after Thanksgiving. So, what I want to do today with you is just spend some time looking at these first couple of verses in this song, and then looking at the long-expected Jesus that we see in it, the way that he is described, and the things that he came to do that we see in his word. And so let's look at verse 1 of this song, and I just want to read these lyrics to you. It says, Come thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us, let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth, thou art dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. See, here we see this Jesus described as this hope, this desire, this longing, this deliverer that we have. This is the first thing that we see about this long-expected Jesus, that he is our long-expected Savior. He is a long-expected Savior. Today, what I want to do is, is just kind of bounce around uh, different things that we see about Jesus in his word as well. And so what I want to do is begin uh, by taking you to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. This will be familiar to many of you. It says this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. As a kid, I remember always feeling like there was something about the Christmas season that made time just slow down. You remember feeling that way, where maybe you would write your Christmas list and all the things that you want, and you'd send it to Santa, or you'd give it to your parents, and and then we had all of these rituals to track the time leading up to the big day. 
fact, I remember we had this uh, kind of snowman decoration. In fact, I had my mom take a picture of it. It looks kind of like this, and we would take those numbers off and change them each day. And I remember waking up and thinking, man, how is it still this far away? I don't know if any of you did this, but we had those uh, chocolate advent calendars. Any of you have those where, where you would open it each day and there'd be that little piece of chocolate? And, and the best was when you would forget for a couple of days because then, you know, bonus chocolate, and that was always fun. And I remember thinking the same thing every December. This month is so long. We have so much to wait for, and it seemed like Christmas would never arrive. And we would just be left with this feeling of anticipation, of counting down hoping that it would get here soon. See, this is what life was like for the people of God who lived before the time of Jesus, waiting for something to arrive, something that you didn't know if it would ever actually get there. Oftentimes, I think when we read the Old Testament or think about those stories, it seems like God is always doing something cool, like he's always performing a miracle, or he's always speaking through a prophet or raising up a king. And, and we read that and we think, you know, why doesn't that happen to us? And yet what we have to remember, we have to think about this, that there were countless people of Israel, countless followers of God, that we will never know their stories, who were called to anonymous faithfulness in the waiting. People who in many ways had lives that looked very similar to ours, waiting for God to do what he said he would do. Called to trust in his timing, and as they waited, they would hold on to promises like the one that we just read in Isaiah. Go ahead and look at, look at that verse again. It says these promises that we have. For someone to come to bring good news to the poor, to heal the hearts of the broken, to proclaim liberty and freedom to those who are bound. In, capt- in, in captivity. And as they waited, this pattern would emerge where God would use prophets and he would use people to encourage and give these promises and to affirm and say, something is coming. A Savior is coming and someone will take away all of these things that are oppressing you. Someone will come and bring you good news for you who are in poverty. Someone will heal the brokenness in your life. Someone will come and bring freedom into your captivity that your waiting is not in vain. This was their lives, waiting for a Savior, counting down the days, not sure how many were left. There was this pattern where this would happen over and over again, and then history tells us that something interesting happened, that all of a sudden that pattern stopped, that for 400 years there were no prophets, there were no words, there were no promises. There was only silence. That for 400 years, there were no prophets, no kings, no miracles. There was only quiet. There was only darkness. There was only silence. Maybe today you know how that feels. Maybe today you know what it feels like to cry out for God, the longing in your heart. To say, God, speak to me. God, heal me. God, give me direction or comfort or wisdom. And to only hear silence, darkness, or quiet. Do you know that feeling? Do you know what it feels like to long out for Jesus? 400 years of silence. And then in a manger, in a small town in the middle of nowhere, a cry that would never be silenced. 400 years of darkness and then unstoppable light. 400 years of quiet and then the praise of a multitude of angels. See, here's what we have to understand, that just because God is silent, it does not mean that he is still. That he has not forgotten you and you are not waiting in vain today. And what the Christmas story teaches is that for every Advent season, there is a Christmas morning. That every time of waiting is a chance for you to remember those that came before us, those that waited without a calendar, those who trusted and believed in the promise of God, the fulfillment of a Savior, the hope of the earth. This is the first lesson of the story, the first thing that we can learn today, that Jesus has come to bring hope. 
Jesus has come to bring hope. Let me read to you uh, a quick couple of verses in Luke chapter 4, because in Luke chapter 4, Jesus himself actually quotes what we just read in Isaiah. It says this, The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, that's Jesus. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. See, this is why we can have hope in the waiting. This is why we can sing out, Come thou long expected Jesus, because Jesus is the fulfillment of what it is we are waiting on. He checks every box. He came with the good news, the good news of the gospel. He came to heal, to heal the physical wounds, the emotional wounds, and ultimately the spiritual brokenness in us. He came to bring freedom to release us from the captivity of our sin, and to open prison doors that we might walk in freedom. This is the Savior that we have been given, the one that we sing of today, the one who is our strength when we are weak and our consolation when we are suffering. He has come to bring you hope today. Earlier, I asked you if there was something that you're hoping for this Christmas. Maybe the better question that we have to answer today is this. What is it that you are putting your hope in? Not just this Christmas, but in every day of your life. What is it that you believe in? What is it that you long for? What is it you believe you need in order to be happy, to have peace in your life? Is it family? Is it health? Is it career? Is it success? Is your hope in yourself. There's a guy named Blaise Pascal. He puts it this way. He says that there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person that cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God, the creator. I wonder for us if there's something that we are trying to put in the place that belongs to Jesus. I wonder if there's something that you have put your trust in, if there's something that you are longing for. If you think, if I can just get this figured out, if I can just find a, a job that I love, if I can just find a spouse, if I, I can just find health and happiness, then I'll be satisfied. And we try to fulfill this eternal hope with earthly desires. It's like when you were a, a kid and you had that one thing that you really wanted for Christmas and you put it on your list and it looked so much fun in that catalog or in that commercial. And as soon as you got it, you were really excited, but then you realized that it wasn't as much fun as you thought it would be. And you know, now that you think about it, the box that it came in looks really cool. It's really big and it looks really fun, and maybe you should start playing with the box. And then your dad is saying that maybe he should have done your shopping at the UPS store. <laughs> of course, things like health and career and family can be good and wonderful parts of life. But when Jesus said that today this has been fulfilled, he was making a statement to you and to me that nothing and no one can be your Savior but Him, that He and only He can bring you fulfillment and joy and peace. This is why He came to us. He came to bring you hope. We also see that Jesus has come to bring rest. There's this beautiful line in this song, this line that says, From our fears and sins release us, let us find our rest in Thee. It's a picture of Jesus as this deliverer, a deliverer from fear and from sin. And how often do those two things go together? How often do our fears inform our failures? How often is it that the person that treated you like you don't matter is afraid that they don't measure up? How often is it that the person who lies to you is afraid of being truly known? But out of these fears, out of these failures— this long-expected Savior delivers us into rest. We see this in uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Again, this may be familiar to some, but it says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me, you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The truth is, for many of us, this is probably not a time that we think of as particularly restful. The holiday season for many is actually quite the opposite. Maybe for, for some of us, for, for students, it's a time to take exams and finish projects and, and get to that finish line. For parents, maybe it's a time of coordinating schedules or travel or figuring out these never-ending to-do lists. Maybe for you, it's a time where the people that you have lost loom a little bit bigger in your heart, where the hurt and the grief that you have a little bit stronger. And when we are in this state, oftentimes it is rest that is the first to go. Not just physical rest, but the rest of our soul. I wonder for you, for me, when is the last time that we rested in the presence of our long-expected Savior? When was the last time you fought your stress or your sin, not by your own strength, but by the words of Jesus? See, there's nothing wrong with the traditions that fill our time. There's nothing wrong with with Christmas parties and presents and all of those things. Those things are great. But the truth is, if you allow those things to take away your rest, not just your physical rest, but the rest of your spirit, if you're too busy this Advent season to reflect on the birth of Jesus, if all this season does is make us feel anxious or overwhelmed, then can I suggest that there is not enough Christ in our Christmas? Jesus offers us something so much better. To those of you today who are weary or heavy laden, commune with your Savior. Talk to him. Reflect on what he has done for you. Read his word and rest will follow, even in the midst of chaos. He has come to bring you rest. Uh, This brings us to the the second way that Jesus is described in this beautiful song. Let's go and look at verse 2 of this verse as we look at this long-expected king. Go and put up the the next verse. That's verse 2. Yep, perfect. Thank you. It says this, Born thy people to deliver, born a child and yet a king, born to reign in us forever, now thy gracious kingdom bring. In other words, Jesus has come as a child and yet as a king, to reign forever, to bring his kingdom to us. Uh, I mentioned that uh, Luca was born eight weeks ago today, and as we get to know him a little bit, the biggest debate in the Scavato house is who he looks like more. Now, it's changed a few times, But the early consensus is that he looks like Judy more than he looks like me. And I have to confess something to you today, that that drives me crazy. (laughs) I know a lot of people are like, oh, I love how much they they look like their mom, but I have too much of an ego for that. I want there to be a little mini-me in the world. And so if we talk after the service, just tell me he looks like me. You don't have to mean it. It's fine. That's just what I need for my emotional well-being. It's been so amazing, though, even in these first few weeks of his life, just to get to know him. To get to know not just his physical appearance, but to start to think about what kind of person he's going to be. To think about what will make him him. His personality, his his characteristics, the things that we'll love about him. And this is what so much of the Old Testament serves for us. It shows us who our king will be. The characteristics that he is like. In fact, we see this in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. It says, for, us to, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be, shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end." on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. See, this is a promise that we have been given, something that is a contrast that doesn't make sense and yet at the same time is such a beautiful part of the Christmas story. A contrast that you might understand if you've ever held or cared for a newborn. 
that at one point the king of the world, the hope of all the earth, the one who is wonderful and wise and mighty and strong and everlasting and full of peace, at one point could fit into his mother's arms. See, this is the beauty of the Christmas story. This is the proof of God's love for us, that Jesus was willing to come to us, that the word became flesh, that he was willing to experience humanity in all its worth. And I love this line of the song. Go ahead and put up verse two again. I I love this line for, for what it says because it shows us the next lesson that we have to take. I love this line, born a child and yet a king. This shows us the next thing that Jesus came to do, that Jesus has come to be king. Jesus has come to be king. He has not just come to be your friend, although he is. He has not just come to teach you how to live, although he can. He has not just come to be your savior, but also to be your Lord, to reign, to have authority over your life. See, we love the image of baby Jesus. We love that image. We love this this idea of light and of hope, and and we love this picture of Christmas. But what we see over and over again throughout the scriptures, the, the lesson that we've learned throughout our study in the book of Mark following the king is that to be a follower of Jesus is to allow him the throne of our hearts, to reign in us forever, that that would be the prayer of our hearts, Jesus, reign in me today. See, this is why it's so good to do this series and to examine the words that we sing. Because we should not sing this lightly. We should not sing this prayer. We should not sing this declaration without considering what it is that we are saying. To say, Jesus, reign in me forever, is to declare the same thing that so many couldn't throughout Jesus' ministry. Several weeks ago, you might remember, we talked about the story of the rich young ruler, this guy who had everything. And yet he could not give up his wealth to follow Jesus. And we talked about this idea that to be a follower of him, to make him the king of your life, is to give up the throne of your heart. To say, at the core of who I am, my very identity and sense of self comes from who he says that I am. Like like it says in John chapter 3, that he must become greater and I must become less. Are we willing to say that today? born to reign in us forever. Now thy gracious kingdom bring. That line maybe sounded familiar to you. Uh, In fact, it sounded familiar to me as well as part of the prayer that we are given in Matthew chapter 6 when Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray. This will be familiar to some of you as well. It says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this is where knowing some of the the context and the history of this song can help us understand this. This song was written by a man named Charles Wesley all the way back in 1744, and he wrote this song as a response to the world around him. He lived in a time where there was poverty and economic disparity all around him, and one of the ways that that was affecting people was, was that there were orphaned children that were not being cared for. And he looked around and he saw that. And he saw all the problems in the world. And this was the cry of his heart. Bring your kingdom, Jesus. Bring your kingdom now. Come, Lord Jesus. This is the last thing that we, say today, that we see today, that Jesus has come to bring his kingdom. In the face of poverty, in the face of homelessness, in the face of children being neglected. Come, Lord Jesus. What if that was our prayer today? What if that was our prayer in the face of all that we see? In the face of school shootings that seem to happen all too often? Come, Lord Jesus. In the face of pandemics and sickness and disease? Come, Lord Jesus. Bring your kingdom. Reign in us. In the midst of cultural unrest and national unrest and all of these problems that we hear about in our country, come, Lord Jesus, bring your kingdom now. In the face of relational issues and family dysfunction, bring your kingdom. 
Come, Lord Jesus. See, this is to be the prayer of our hearts. This is to be the longing that we have, the, the desperation that we have, our response in the face of a broken world. Come, Lord Jesus. Bring your kingdom. Now, this is a prayer that shouldn't lead to apathy or spiritual laziness, but instead should give us purpose in the waiting. That we, the church, will be part of this kingdom. That we will be part of his will being done on earth as it is in heaven. This is, in fact, how the entire Bible ends. In Revelation chapter 22, this is the last two verses of all of Scripture that we have been given. It says this, He who testifies, that's Jesus, to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. This is what we are left with. This is to be the cry of our hearts. This is why we can have hope in the midst of hopelessness. It's why we do not give up, because just like the people of Israel all those years ago, we have been given a promise that we are in a period of Advent and Christmas morning is coming. That Jesus has promised us that he will return and he will bring his kingdom in all its fullness. But as much as we are all longing for something this Christmas season, there will be a day for you and for me if we have put our faith in him where all of our longings, all of our hope, every desire will find its fulfillment in him. Let this be the cry of your heart this Advent season. For him to come to you, to reign in your life, and to bring his kingdom. Let us be people whose deepest desire is for our long-expected Jesus, the one who was born to save us. This is what we remember today as we come to the table at communion. We remember, we, we honor, we give gratitude towards the Savior born to us, willing to die. And so today, let's do that. You can go ahead and grab your communion elements and take that top layer off as we reflect on the significance of this moment. Here at Chapel Street, many of you are aware of this, but at Chapel Street, we believe this is God's table and not ours, and so you don't have to be a member to participate in this, but rather just to have put your faith in what he has done for you. And so as you take this bread, we think back to the moment that Jesus was with his disciples. And he looked at them and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. can take that next layer off as we continue to reflect back on that night that he was at the table with his friends and he looked at them and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This is the reason we can have hope. This is the reason we look forward with anticipation. And so drink this as often as you do in remembrance of me. Jesus, we thank you now for this reminder of your love. We thank you for this time of waiting, of anticipation, of hope. God, we thank you that we have hope that does not disappoint, hope that we can hold on to, hope that is eternal, hope that rests in you. Father, I pray now that we would allow you to reign in us, or that we will be a part of your kingdom coming to this earth. Father, allow us to focus on you in this time, in this season, that we would seek you first. Amen. Again, we're so thankful that you joined us today. We're thankful for the purpose that we have come here. We want to invite you to join us for our meet and greet if you're newer around here. And now would you stand for today's benediction? May you go now in the name of the long-expected Jesus, your Savior and your King. Go now as people of hope and of rest, as followers of the King, part of his eternal kingdom. Amen. You're dismissed.